Welcome to Citizens Forum. My name is Walter McGinnis, and today I have with me Liz Galinkowski, and Liz is a member of the BC Refed Party, and we're going to talk about a few issues affecting uh, British Columbia today, uh, and how the BC Refed Party views these issues. Welcome to the show, Liz. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, Firstly, maybe you could just give us a brief history of the BC Refed Party so people know where, where you guys come from. Actually, it, this party was taken over from, I think it was Western Concept or something of that nature in 2000. Oh, right. And then the name changed. Yeah, Western Canada Concept. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. I don't give much thought to that. Yeah. don't have time. And um, the foundation of the party has always been that we need to change, not voting or not politicians or parties, but we need to change the system of government right. to a direct democracy model. Right. And the system that we've looked at and decided would serve us well is the Swiss system. Right. So we've been working on that and uh, we're continued, continuing to grow. Yeah. Um, and that's speeding up a little bit. So, 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 how does it work? Like, you know, is it like a more, like more often you'd have referendums on big questions? Like, say, if you wanted to build the Site C dam in Switzerland, they'd they'd have to have more process than what we have here in British Columbia. Well, first of all, they would have to be open and transparent yeah. about everything that's gone on. And one of the things that's happened with Site C is that there has never been a safety assessment oh. done on it. And that is a huge problem. So they would have to do that. The public would get to know and see everything that they had done and the results of it and so on. Yeah. From there, if the, the people, as particularly Treaty 8 people and the people that live up there, yeah. I mean, this is uh, or their home, their life, everything, yeah. right? And when you flood that area, you're not only destroying a river valley, you're taking away farmland, you're taking away traditions from um, indigenous people, and, uh, and then what are they going to do? Because they've been up there for thousands of years. Yeah, so it's equivalent to burning down somebody's house, basically because they're just destroying that, that habitat that people have used for so long. Exactly. Anyway. So, so the thing is, is that it would only take one person to uh, gather up the number of signatures that are required. Yeah. And we are going to tweet that Swiss system a little bit by saying that the number of signatures that have to be acquired will be limited to the area that the issue affects right so because people in vancouver don't know much about site c if they've even heard of it yeah so for them to vote in a referendum they're they're not educated enough to make no a i mean they just they don't understand yeah. the area the land the you know what it means to people and what they're destroying yeah if, for example, the Swiss government wanted to start putting in some alternative electrical energy, which I think British Columbians would be very much in agreement with, yeah. then they can just proceed. As long as nobody wants to object, yeah. it just carries on. So it's not as if we're having a referendum every few weeks, every time the government decides to do something. Yeah. But we would have the ability to hold the government to account when they are squandering, misusing, uh, and perhaps even fraudulently extracting money from the taxpayers for no worthwhile project at all. That's and that's right. what Site C is. I know, and, and it's funny when you look at all the problems with democracy and all the problems with people being informed and all that, all gets encapsulated in the issues around Site C Dam. So that's the next thing I think we should look at is, is do you think that the construction of the Site C Dam still can be stopped? Oh, of course. The fact is that 
there is no dam construction going on yet, yeah. even at this time. Yeah. They are still trying to figure out what they're going to do with the slides and the fact that they have never found bedrock there and all they are is trying to build um, an extra large dam on shale. Right, and, and one would think perhaps maybe they should have done that that geological survey before they started building the dam. They've you been know. doing geological surveys in that area since the 1970s. Every time they did it, the report came back, it's no good, you can't build a dam over there. <laughs> that is remarkable to think about. I mean, of all the other mistakes they're making, this, this kind of is like the icing on it. It's like, yeah, and the whole darn thing could collapse and it could threaten people's lives downriver. Yes, it? yeah, absolutely. And um, we've been working with a retired engineer, Dr. Vern Ruskin, who was involved in building all of the dams in British yeah. Columbia. BC Hydro has never built a big dam here. Yeah. They haven't. It was BC Electric that oh, built right. all the dams. Yeah. Right? So when they say, oh, you know, our dams are, uh, have good safety records, well, yes, but you didn't have your hands on it when it was being built. Yeah, and it was under different management. You know, well, and, it was under different ownership. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if you know how this all works with engineering companies and uh, especially these very large projects, if they don't work, if there's big problems, they just make more money. Yes. So Absolutely. where's the incentive? You know, let's just build it. Oh, it might fall down. So it might cost another four or five billion dollars and it might still fall down. So we're in, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, it is so frustrating. Uh, this issue for anybody that's looked at it, the common sense is just flying, flowing out the window. And uh, obviously uh, the government's, uh, you know, catering to the needs and the wishes of people other than the people of this province. But anyway, just to move on from one problem to the next, okay. is let's look at the um, LNG uh, proje uh, projects now that uh, the NDP now have approved. And uh, we're looking at some of the issues around the safety of, of uh, shipping LNG. So what do you think are the major problems with putting an LNG plant up in Kitimat? Well, the first problem is not where it is. The first problem is we don't know whether the money that is being invested is being lent to British Columbia to build whatever they need to build, yeah. or whether it's actually owning, buying the resources before they come out of the ground and before they're built, yeah. which means we're going to get less of whatever pittance there was there. Now, who's investing in LNG? Of the, um, you know? I didn't bring my notes, but there are yeah. five different countries. There's Shell, there's Petronas, um, China, yeah, and two others that just have escaped my mind. Okay, no worries, but these are very large corporate interests. Uh, yes, foreign, and, and, foreign and, govern governments. and government controlled in yeah. some cases. So we're really getting embroiled in a very complicated investment process. And uh, do you think that, is there any chance, is there any chance in, for us in British Columbia to actually put, setting aside all the environmental devastation that you know, we could get into about fracking and all that, do you think there's any chance that we could actually get a net, some gain, that we could actually make some money off of this? No. No, <laughs> absolutely no, absolutely not. If you think about forty billion dollars, and it's true that the price of LNG has come up a little bit, yeah. but by the time you, by the time you use that money to build that structure, yeah. and then you have to build the uh, ships that are going to carry it, yeah. and then. Um, you have to consider the distance that this is going to have to go. You have to consider how other countries that may want to buy it yeah. are going to, uh, you know, kind of 
screw us right down to the last to the penny. the best, best deal you can get. Exactly, right? Yeah. So the thing is, is that my mind cannot even comprehend how much LNG we would have to move yeah. and how many um, holes we would have to drill yeah. because that stuff is not easy to capture. Yeah. Um, to pay back $40 billion. Yeah. It, no, it's it is just remarkable. Sense. So just get, to get back to what's wrong with yeah. it, Kitimat is the worst place in the world, maybe, to put that kind of a facility because the Douglas Channel is 56 miles long. Yeah. Okay? Now we're going to have some very big ships that are going to be in there, and they have to come in, they have to turn around, yeah. they have to get back out of there. And particularly in fall, when the weather gets nasty, yeah. wow, it's like you're well, just Well, I just looking. checked on the map and, and then look at the waterway up into Kitimat. There's just a sort of a line. You don't see very much blue in there, so it's a very, very narrow channel. It is. I, I was up there and I couldn't get through the fence. They wouldn't let me go up right up to the water. But I just looked at that and I just shook my head and I said, you know, this is insanity. And I thought it was insane on the map. Yeah. It, it is worse when you get up close and personal with yeah. that channel. So, the, and because of the number of ships they're thinking about bringing in and taking out, they're going to be passing each other. It's not like the ferries here. Yeah. Once they get to the end of the Douglas Channel, now we have to m maneuver around yeah. some islands before we ever get out to... Into the, into the uh, sea, in the large yeah, ocean. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, here we are. The reason that people fought against the, the that uh, process yeah. in the first place was the location of it yeah. and now we're back doing the same silly thing we did like a couple of years ago yeah doesn't make any sense to me and especially in in this time when you know i was reading some articles from australia and they have just almost the same issues going on with with natural gas development large corporations coming in driving down any sort of royalties that ever possibly could be accrued and, and basically controlling the, the, the development outside of the, any input from the Australian people. And there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of controversy there. And they, in the end, are competing with us. And we're the, the, uh, the people that are in the middle are driving down the prices everywhere. Exactly. And the people that own the resources are having to give them away. So, like, how would this change? And this is the last question I'm going to ask you. Now, how would this work? If we had a more of a, uh, a process with uh, that, that, that the BC refed is suggesting for making decisions on large projects, would this be a project that would be a good example of where somebody could step in and, and say, yeah, we should have a referendum? One of the nice things about direct democracy, if you if you create the uh, workings of it properly and we have already begun that process. We're well along our way. The first thing that has to happen is that the government has to be absolutely open and honest. Yeah. Because if they are not, they're not going to have very much parliamentary, parliamentary privilege. Yeah. We will see to it that they will be uh, punished yeah. for deceit and lies yeah. and so on and so on. All of this has to be shown to the public. So when, you, when they have to come clean and say, we're going to have to sell this stuff below our cost. Yeah. <laughs> and see how that's going to fly. You know. It won't get off the ground. No, it won't. It won't get off the ground. There are, if, if we can just think about all of the benefits we could have just from that 10 or yeah. 12 or 14 or 15 billion dollars that Site C is going to cost us. Yeah. I mean, we could have hospitals, we could have housing. Housing. Yeah. Cheap, not cheap housing, but affordable housing. No, we be could, remarkable. you know, put some constraints on financial institutions yeah. who are primarily responsible for boosting up the price of housing. That's right. 
Well, Liz, it's great to talk to you. It's great to touch on these couple of big, big issues here in British Columbia. And uh, the, your ideas are very fresh, and I think the public should be really thinking about, because we're really in an era now, people are, are opening up to having other ideas and how to, how to have a democratic uh, society. And I think we should really look at, look at this sort of model also and to see how, how it could work here in British Columbia. So thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure on my part too. So there you go. That uh, wraps up the first segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. It is Wednesday, October the 24th, and my guest is Patricia Lane, and we're going to be talking about proportional representation, which I think is not only an important issue, but an, something that can help our poor democracy and the poor people of this province who are so powerless. Um, and I think proportional representation is more democratic and it will give us more of a voice. And that's why it's coming under such attack because the power structure knows that what I've just said is true and they don't want proportional representation because they run the show and they don't want to give up any of their power. Anyways, Patricia, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the outcomes, what proportional representation can do for us. Right, so... Or however you want to begin. Okay, well thanks for having me. Um, uh, so I think it's very uh, easy to track the trends and there's a man named Lippart who spent his very distinguished academic career thinking about electoral reform and he wrote a book um, about this so it's very well documented not just by him but by other well-known academics like Max Cameron and Dennis Pilon, some of whom are Canadian. And there's kind of no, it's not disputed that um, the countries that, first of all, most modern democracies are proportional, have proportional representation in their lawmaking houses, right? So it's important to remember that what we're talking about is how we decide who people, who the people are that make our laws. Just kind of drilling down, back down to basics. So. Um, so it's therefore no surprise to me to learn that proportional representation countries have much better track records on narrowing the income inequality gap and on action on climate. Why is that no surprise to me? Because the people of the world want action on climate and they don't like societies where the rich keep getting richer and fewer of them. And Let's keep going. Sorry, the rich keep getting richer and fewer and fewer of them, and the poor get poor, get, keep getting poorer and poorer and more of them, right? So people have a basic sense that that's not right. And, and so all over the world, you, you know, if you poll people, you find consensus about that. So why is that so obvious to me? Well, because if you have an electoral system, that reflects the, the will of 95% of the people, you're going to get policies and laws that reflect their will too. The first past the post system reflects the will of a minority. And so, for example, in Ontario, and Doug, For uh, uh, Doug Ford in Ontario has been able to begin to dismantle our country basically by the use of the notwithstanding clause. He's just rolled back the minimum wage. People in Ontario who voted for him didn't vote for those things. So how can he get away with it? Well, he has 38% of the popular vote, but he holds 100% of the power. And so more people voted against Doug Ford than voted for him. But because of the way the seats are distributed, he can do whatever he wants. He doesn't need the consent of any other party, nor does he need to speak for 50% of the people when he's making laws. So that's the promise of proportional representation, that no law will ever be passed that doesn't have the support of the majority of people, which means it's much harder to roll it back and if, when the governments change. So if you think about the big problems of our time, like climate and income inequality, 
um, we, we can't solve those problems with two, three, four year long mandates. We need long, long mandates to think about how we resolve those things. But if you have a government that keeps changing, Doug Ford is just about to roll back all of the considerable progress that Kathleen Wynne's government made on climate, uh, and it's going to cost taxpayers billions of dollars to do that. Um, but under proportional representation, that doesn't happen nearly so much because when the law got passed, it reflected the common sense of at least 50% of the people. And I think that more importantly for me than even that is that proportional representation is more difficult for the power structure to control. It really does give people more of a voice. It I mean, I watch election after election, and they're all the same. There's usually two big parties, and they're around 35% each as you're leading up to the election. And then the media will support one and attack the other, and that one will go up to 40 and win a majority. And everybody knows that the media can do it. So they all, all the politicians have to sort of do what they're told, because if that power is arrayed against them, they're going down. Whereas with proportional representation, it doesn't matter. If one goes up to 40 and one goes down to 30, it doesn't matter. They don't get the government. They only get 40% of the seats. And you still need that other 60% who may feel completely differently. Well, and they do. One of the other things we know about proportional representation countries is that people participate more. In Denmark and uh, there's another Nordic country, participation rates in elections are around 90%. 80, 90 percent, because people know that their votes matter. So they go to the polls and they mark their ballot and they know that their values will be reflected in the legislature. So they feel empowered to express their values when they vote. And that's one of the main reasons why the participation of young people goes up under pro -rep, in pro-rep countries too. You know, when young people vote in this election, if they vote in my riding, you know, my son says to me, and he was raised in a politically sophisticated household, why should I bother doing the research to figure out who I should vote for when we know that the candidate that is in place now is going to get in? We live in a safe seat. I don't have a good answer for him. Yeah. And, but there's no such thing as safe seats under proportional representation. And, um, and so we know that young people are raised now to feel as if their vo voices should matter and they participate where their voices matter and they don't where they don't. And so I was uh, listening to Simca Marshall last night, a very impressive young Douglas um, college student in Vancouver. She's indigenous and she was giving a speech and she said, proportional representation matters to us. Please deal us in. And I thought that was such a good way of saying it, you know. First past the post deals young people out. And uh, proportional representation will deal them in. And when we hear their voices, now we're thinking about the future. Because countries that have high participation rates by young people have free tuition. Germany, tuition is free for post-secondary. They have good daycare programs. They have uh, thought really hard about income inequality and about affordable housing. And their policies about climate are so much stronger because we know that young people are very thoughtful about those issues today. I think in a lot of proportional representation countries that are, I mean, we'll, I, I shouldn't say that because let's, let's just look at Northern Europe, which I have some familiarity with. Um, the societies I have seen there over the past 20 years have just surpassed us in so many, so many, many areas. Even though we have all the natural resources and all the space and all the everything, they seem to have better, safer, more equal, uh, thoughtful uh, societies. And I think a big part of it is because they use proportional representation and it lets the citizens have a bigger voice in what happens, which I guess is exactly what you said to start us off. It and is, people and, want what's and it's good not just for them. Northern Europe, it's Germany, it's Switzerland, it's Ireland, it's New Zealand. Um, 
And, and, and we know that, that's another thing we know about proportional representation countries, that people in those countries feel better about their governments, even if they didn't vote for them. That's a kind of foreign concept in Canada. You know, you didn't vote for the government, you're going to spend the next four years disliking them, right? So, but that doesn't happen in pro-rep countries. I've got very good friends in Germany who didn't vote for the current regime, but they feel very good about what's going on. I've got a brother in Ireland who just says the political discourse changed radically when they brought in proportional representation. And we had a visit from the Prime Minister of, Swe of um, New Zealand who said exactly the same thing. And in fact, there was fierce opposition to bringing in pro-rep in New Zealand. They just had their second vote, like we're going to have after two election cycles. People overwhelmingly voted to keep it. And so people, you know, they like, one of the things that they like about it is that you can't just go off on your high horse like Doug Ford is doing or like Donald Trump is doing. You have to consult with other parties because you can't pass a law without representation from 50% of the populace. So that means you have to be thoughtful about it. And, and, and that means that it's going to be more reflective of the views of more people. And you can't be nasty to this party today because you might end up making a lot with them tomorrow. So it makes for much different political discourse. For my living, I'm a mediator. I spend my life building bridges. And I'm very uncomfortable with the divisive one-upmanship that we see in modern politics. A lot of black and white thinking in North American politics. You're either with us or you're against us. Right? I just don't subscribe to that. And I think most people cross most party lines most of the time. And so to have a government that sees people working together across party lines and therefore being forced to cooperate with each other and to get to know each other and to build relationships regardless of partisan loyalties, that's a good thing. And that seems to me to be very Canadian. You know, it's a very fundamental part of who we are that we think of ourselves as being able to get along with people and work things out and approach things from new, creative, imaginative art, um, angles to do things for people that are right. So there is a no side <laughs> that will totally disagree with everything you've said. They are, I think, very well funded. Um, to me, they represent the one percent, not, not the people who believe what they're saying, because they're very sophisticated in the, in the story they give. But the people funding the no side, I think, uh, are doing it because they don't want the kinds of things that Patricia is talking about. Actually, what's interesting about it is they don't disagree. You never hear the no side talking about the things I've just been talking about, ever. You hear them raging a, fair, a fear campaign based on, you know, how the world would be terrible um, when every vote when when every yeah. voter matters, right? It goes on and on. But it's it's uh, it's not based on any facts. It's based on supposition and and innuendo. And I've never heard anybody on the no side disagree with me about the trends in terms of income inequality and climate action. And they just don't do it. And that's because they're forced into a fear based. A campaign which is fact-free um, by uh, because there's no factual reason to disagree. So, you know, they they'd have you believe that. Oh, I don't know. They used to say that, you know, ridings you wouldn't get local representation. Well, that's just a lie. Every option open to British Columbians under this uh, referendum guarantee strong local representation. So are you saying they said that it, they said the opposite? They did. They outright lied? Well, so this is a very well understood tactic, yes. Very well understood tactic in disinformation campaigns. You take something that is true about the other side and you make it seem as if it's got to do with the change and then people get scared and stay home. That's the same tactic they used. They actually birthed the tactic around persuading uh, decision makers that tobacco, banning tobacco was a bad idea. Then they did it on climate denial, persuading decision makers that there was some doubt that there was science. Remember that? Some doubt behind yes, yes. the climate science, right? 
And then they really perfected it in the uh, U.S. elections. And now it's alive and well. It helped to get Doug Ford elected, and it's helping to bolster up the pro-rep campaign. And if you have some doubts about that, just go look uh, on the Fair Vote website and, and see who is behind the no side. And you'll see the same pollster who worked for Doug Ford is working for them. And he uses the same kind of vicious, micro-targeting, fear-based campaign. It's brilliant, and that's what we're up against. Good luck to us all. Thank you very much, Patricia, for, for that. And um, pro-rep is important. The opposition is powerful. Uh, let's see what we can do. Thanks for watching this segment on Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It is Wednesday, October the 24th. My guest is my family doctor, uh, Dr. James Houston. Um, we've known each other patient and doctor-wise for many, many years. And we're going to be talking about the state of primary care in our city. And I'm not sure what primary care means, so you can start with that. Um, primary care is um, the extension of what used to be general practice in the community. And primary care is, is a international term now for the sort of first place to go for your health care needs of a patient. So it could be a doctor, it could be um, a nurse practitioner, it could be a nurse, it could be um, physio a, or is that yeah, too... The physio is more specialized. So it's someone who can assess um, your state of health and triage you to the right person um, or diagnose treat you. And so primary care physicians are the sort of the backbone of the healthcare system. And they would, um, uh, if they're not over taxed and burdened as they seem to be these days, they would work up your medical condition and um, treat you and hopefully keep you healthy using preventive medicine uh, policies as well. And if there was something that was more serious that required a specialist care, they would refer you on to the specialist. Um, family physicians are the primary care providers that we mainly see these days, although there is a number of nurse practitioners now coming into that format. Um, yeah. Now, when I was growing up, I never gave the system a thought, but I do know that the system was excellent and was probably one of the best in the world. In fact, a lot of countries came here to see what we did and then copied us. Uh, everybody had a doctor. The thought of not having a doctor, I don't think ever even occurred to anybody. Everybody had a doctor. I don't think you had to wait to see a doctor. If you went into emergency, everything was, uh, you know, you couldn't imagine it being any better. So we've come a long way from, from that. And we can go back, but that's another story. Yes, yes, certainly uh, we were ranked very high probably back in the 70s um, and we've steadily fallen uh, since that time. And I think we're ranked way down around 24th in the world or something like that now. Although the average Canadian still thinks we've got one of the best systems, which is good, but they're having harder and harder time accessing medical care. You may now phone up to get an appointment with your doctor and it's four to six weeks down the road. And that doesn't make sense if you just need something more acutely or you run out of your medications or you need a blood pressure check. You should be able to get in fairly quickly in a timely manner and be assessed. Um, you have to be. So the, one of the reasons for that is that there are just less providers. Uh, the um, the landscape has changed, so you have uh, a situation in Victoria right now where there is probably 60 to 70,000 orphaned patients that can't find a family doctor that would take them on, or a primary care practitioner of any sort. And uh, this is growing. If you look at the British Columbia statistics, there is about 700 and 20,000 people in the province that can't find a family doctor, or 16% of the population. About three years ago, 
that was only 12 percent. So you can see it's it's drifting sideways, and um, the there the need is for the new family doctors that come out of training to go into family practice in the community and this isn't happening. Primarily it's not happening in Victoria and Vancouver because these young grads come out with a debt of two to three hundred thousand dollars. They have no business sense. They don't want to take over a business and run a business. They just want to practice medicine and they need to pay back their debt. So they can't conceive of taking over a practice business. Um, they are drawn to working in the hospital as a hospitalist, which um, pays very well. And this is a system that's developed since the days of old. Um, there was a time when family practitioners did everything. They went to the hospital in the morning, saw their patients in hospital, managed them in hospital, went to the office, saw their patients in the hospital in the office did house calls delivered babies and that um, worked it worked yeah there is there is enough time in the day to do all those things and the um, relative remuneration was sufficient that you could have a, a, a decent lifestyle um, and manage all those components because if you think about going to the hospital in the morning, you may have one patient in one hospital and then you've got to go out to the other hospital, you may have one patient there. It's a 15, 20 minute trek at least, in rush hour it's even more. So by the time you get to the office, you may have spent an hour and 20 minutes just seeing two people. The economics now don't support that. It's, it's not worth going to the, to the hospital to see those patients even though they would benefit from you going. So doctors elected to stay in their offices. So what happened They used was, to make house calls. And they used to make house calls. Well, I still make house calls, but <laughs> many doctors don't. Um, wow. So, so the role that the GPs used to have in the hospital was vacated, and the specialists didn't want to do the ongoing general practice care of patients. They just wanted to deal with their specialty. So the, the position of a hospitalist was formed. So basically, these are GPs that work just in the hospital and see patients that are brought in from the community for hospital care under a specialist or just under themselves. And so they've got a fairly lucrative deal and they only work um, nine days on, nine days off, or six days on, six days off. They have different programs, but basically when they're off- They're like hockey players. We, yeah. <laughs> That's right, they're doing a shift. When they're off, they're not having to check their yeah, right, inbox course, and check yeah. the notes and everything else. They're actually off, yeah. whereas the community doctor is never continually off. gets all the information coming back from all the yeah. tests they've ordered, the consults yeah, they've yeah, sent yeah, to. Yeah. So they're actually checking their inbox on weekends at home and everything else. So, and the hospitalists have about a, probably a 30% pay better pay situation than the community doctors. So we've seen a number of GPs, not just the new doc, but a number of GPs saying, hey, I'm going to go work in the hospital because I get more time off and my time off is my time okay. and the pay is a lot better. So you said here, in, I can't remember the number in Victoria, but you said 720,000 people in BC don't have a doctor. Yeah. How many patients does the average doctor like yourself have in your box? Well, my, I've been practicing for 40 years, and, and I have, and the, the doctors of BC and the BC government send out a little performance review every year to say how many patients you've got, how many visits of this type you've had, and so on, and do you conform with the norm. Um, my practice consistently has been somewhere between three and 4,000 patients. The average doctor in BC or in Victoria has probably 1,400 patients. Well, 1,500. Canada-wide, the average GP has 900 patients. So to, to, well, that's only around 500 doctors. If we had an extra 500 doctors, that would cover the whole 720, 500. Well, so there's, it doesn't seem like that big a number. There's about 65 hospitalists in Victoria. Right. 
GPs doing hospital work only. Right. If you took those and put them back in the community, right. it would absorb all those patients. Oh my goodness. And you wouldn't need the hospitalists because the doctor could come well, and see you them. Well, the, 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 the timing thing, the flow thing doesn't work. So, right, right, right. But so it could work, I guess. It used to work. It used to work, but that was before um, the cost of living went up and, and the so basically what you're happening right now is too, you, the doctors in the old days would, would have a comfortable um, routine of seeing all these people with not really rushing, maybe see in their office, maybe see 14, 15 patients in their office. Now you have to see 30 to 40 patients just to make ends meet, which means the patients are saying, hey, you're rushing me, doc. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, you are. And, and you know, yeah. and, and you try to do the best you can to. Doctors to used to see thirteen or fourteen patients a day. Now they see, yeah, thirty or forty. My father was a GP. He practiced. <laughs> he practiced in Victoria, and that's that's what you know. He did the whole thing: house calls, maybe thirteen to fourteen patients a day, um, chat to the other doctors in the common room, yeah. in the afternoon, go have a game of tennis. Um, he managed to. Have and a, people were healthier. People, presumably, were healthier. <laughs> so yes. yeah, we're not, so we were going to talk about. Uh, well, I think we've talked about how we got here a little bit. But how to improve? How to fix things up? Right. So um, well, basically, so we got a shortage of manpower, and but every year we graduate out of the Victoria part anyway of UBC Medical School. We graduate twenty-four family practice new docs, and they're scattering to the hospital, they're going up north, they're going to where they can make some money. We need to actually make it attractive for them to actually do what they train to do, which is work in community family medicine. Here in Victoria? Here in Victoria. And so uh, the, the obvious thing would be to level the playing field so that if they can go and earn this money in the hospital, why can't they earn the same money in the community? Why can't the, gov the government put in place a structure where some of those overheads, because in the hospital you don't have to pay for rent, you don't have to pay for nursing, you don't have to pay for staff. Yeah, you just, you go in, you work your eight or yeah. ten hours and you're out. So, a similar situation in a community clinic where you would have um, here, Viviha, covering the cost of the structure, covering the cost of nurses, maybe mental health workers, maybe social workers, and, and having pharmacists as part of a team with the family doctor. That was the dream. 20 or 30 years ago. Yes, and now the dream hasn't materialized here. Oh. It, it, it has materialized. Uh, Alberta's probably got the best model for this, and they realized this 15 years ago, and it's been, they have this model where you have patient medical homes, and you have urgent care clinics, and what they found is that much, uh, everyone has an attachment to a clinic. They can all get timely access to the doctor. Um, the doctors are happy. They're actually, the Alberta doctors make substantial more money than the BC doctors do. The number of people going to the emergency is less. So the, the, to the government, it's cost neutral. But Everyone's happy better. and it's cost neutral. And they've now followed this for 15 years and know it works. So, so as a family doctor, you'd be working in an office just like you are, but you yeah. wouldn't have to worry about any of the paying the rent and, and yeah, we, pay we do medicine rather than right, manage right, a business. Right, 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 right. Uh, rather than have the two hats, yeah. So when we talk about how to improve, th there's a model already there. Yes. Yeah. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there is uh, there is stuff going on in BC now. I mean, there's a uh, there's a, a first model of this going on actually in Colwood as we speak. Uh, what was St. Anthony's Clinic is now becoming one of these patient medical homes. It's early days. There's lots of little hiccups and nuances that need to be ironed out, but. The government would like to see us move uh, in that direction, and I think using the Alberta model makes sense because it's been it's been working for 15 years. It's well studied, and they know it works. And when they first introduced it, it it had some hiccups. It takes a couple of years of sort of getting it going. But in your opinion, it's it it does a better job for the province. Yeah, yeah. patients are happy, the doctors are happy, and the government less happy. weights, less less problems. Yeah, yeah. There we have it, from problem to solution in 14 and a half minutes. Thank you very much, James. You're very welcome. <laughs> and thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.
Welcome back. It's still October the 24th. It's the Walton Jack Show. Um, I just want to start off talking about proportional representation. Uh, it's just being attacked by CFACs. And I mean, I can't even listen to it anymore. It's just, it, it's so vicious because to me, proportional representation is more democratic. And, and I know that's not what CFAC stands for. That's what they pretend to stand for, but, but that's not it. So uh, there's this one host who's on in the morning, Adam Sterling, and he's always saying, you know, he's working for us, and he's really, he's really worried, shall we say, about proportional representation, how bad it's going to be for us. Um, but Adam Sterling doesn't work for us, and we should always keep this in mind. Adam Sterling works for Bell Media, and Bell Media is owned by Bell Canada. And the chairman of the board of Bell Canada is Mr. Nixon. I can't remember his first name. So the chairman of the board of Bell Canada, which owns CFAX, um, was the CEO of the Royal Bank of Canada for 13 years. So that, my friends, is who Adam Sterling, and, and I don't want to pick on Adam Sterling, they all work for, this is, who, this, is who the, this is who owns the media. Bell owns about 60 radio stations in the country, and they own the CTV network. And much more is owned by Shaw, and much more is owned by Rogers, and in Quebec, there's Quebec Corps, who owns just about everything in the whole province. So our entire media is controlled by half a dozen or ten corporations, and believe me, if you want to be in that media, you can't say what I'm saying right now, <laughs> because you're not going to be working there next week. Right? So that's a big problem for us. We have a great chance with proportional representation. It's 50-50 now. I think we were up 70 to 30, but this you know, it, it, it's just the way it's being played. It's too bad. Uh, you say it's 50-50, Jack. Is that a, That's my a guess. No, no oh, poll. Just uh, yeah. the, the Vegas odds makers. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's so much about it is uh, what's not being said. You know, if you think about the, the, the Site C Dam, it has this whole slope that's on one side of the dam that's crumbling, that's falling down. And they can't even start building the dam because of that. But we're not hearing about that. No. So crucial, crucial facts that the public should know about when they make decisions of this sort. Are, we're, we were never told that, that this might be a problem. And I, it always makes me think about, <clears throat> like if you're an engineering firm or a construction firm and you have something like that happening, you know, could drive the costs up, could double the costs again. So they just make terrible. more money. Yeah. So where's the incentive to, 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 to do the correct thing and, and not start a dam like that? Yeah. And when you say we weren't told, we should think about who didn't tell us. Not only the liberals who took Site C you know, from beginning to where it is now, yeah. but the NDP never told us that. I mean, yeah. I, I'm a member of the NDP. I'm not getting angry emails saying the liberals never told us that you know, the, the thing yeah. is unstable. And nor did they ever tell us that BC Hydro lied about, about the costs from the very beginning. They, used, they didn't lie. They used a different system, a yeah. formula, than everybody else, than every other utility in North America, according to an expert. And when you put the numbers into the BC Hydro uh, equation, um, hydro comes out cheaper than, than wind. But when you put the numbers into everybody else's equation, wind comes out cheaper than hydro. Yeah. So we were given phony numbers from the beginning, and we were never told, not by the media, they knew. Not by the NDP, they knew, <clears throat> not by the Liberals. <clears throat> yeah, when it comes to costs too, I mean, uh, one of my co-workers today mentioned, you know, they listened to the CBC and the, the federal environment minister is trying to sell this carbon tax to the public. and how this is going to be good for everybody and they're going to give us the money back to do good things and all that and uh, using an economic argument for that and he said well how about as a motivation to do things like this to save the planet why don't we just talk about the chances of whether we're going to survive as a civilization how much is that worth and they're not phrasing it that way they're, they're trying to do this 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 weaselly economic argument saying, oh, we're going to tax you, we give you your money back, and you're going to do good things with it. But, I, you know, the thing is that we're missing the whole point. We're in a crisis, a global crisis. And we don't have to talk about all the other stuff. 
the economics of it. By the way, the economics are what oppresses us right now. You talk about this fellow from the Royal Bank, now as the head of uh, Bell Media and all that. Well, these are the banksters that <laughs> people are talking about. These are the guys that are pulling the strings globally. I mean, you're worried about the, the Dow Jones and you're worried about stocks and things wildly fluctuating. These are the guys that are pulling those strings. And we are just... I'm not just, worried about the Dow Jones, by the way. Just that, that, you know, today, yeah. this week, uh, this month, uh, the stock markets are coming down. And, and that seems to be the direction we're being taken in. And people should, you know, we're, we're going to see very soon. This is being filmed on the 24th. Uh, by the time anybody's watching this, we'll see where we are. Who knows what they've got planned. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the problem, is that we're not really getting our heads straight and looking at these issues in a way that should be dealt with. You know, if uh, you had a family member who was ill and you wanted them to be well, at what lengths would you not go to? What, what are we talking about? No, we, we have certain human things that we have to have to survive on this planet, and we're rapidly losing these conditions. All, all other matters are not important. As long as we listen to the economic arguments, they get our control over us. As long as we say, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't afford this, we can't afford that, we can afford a $40 billion uh, LNG investment. Now, who knows where that money is going to be coming from and who's going to get it, but, and, and how many billions of dollars to Site C and uh, all this other money that's being splashed around for these mega projects. And we have people without, how, without housing, without fundamental, our, our fundamental needs are not being met. And there's this huge dichotomy between the thinking that has to go on from, we can't follow the strict economic model. We just have to set that aside and say, okay, economics are part of the issue, but not the dictatorship of economics. Yeah, because we can use economics to give us what we want. Instead, right. economics is being used by our oppressors to, yeah. to you know, and I mean, what, uh, what our guest said earlier about proportional representation, it, uh, it, um, it, it gives people more control over our government. That's right. And in a more, in a more, the more humanity involved in the decision making, yeah. you know, the collaboration and uh, thoughtfulness and, and really getting together to try to come up with solutions. And we do have to move away from this first past the post model because it's part of it's part of the political system that's so easily manipulated by very, very powerful entities. And that's been shown in the last 20 or 30 years where you can have, like in the United States, the Democrats have been winning elections, several of them, and, they, and they've gone to the Republicans. They, they consistently get more votes. But the way they are able to gerrymander the, the system, they can make it so that the Republicans win. Yeah, it's very dangerous to have two parties who both are controlled by business yeah. interests. What a nightmare down there. You know what? I'd like to talk a little bit about 5G, which is, yeah. uh, I mean, 5G means fifth generation. It's the new rollout of why, because I just got something, I think, from Sharon Noble. I mean, they're putting out these things everywhere, everywhere. They're, yeah. they're little transmitters on all, st I mean, how prevalent are they? And I, I think it hasn't been turned on yet, but it must be getting close. Well, it's another way to send a, send a signal to people that want to consume video, want wireless, to consume uh, you know, uh, internet and, and TV and such. But what with the 5G is, uh, it's a wireless technology. So basically, they're bringing fiber optics in into our neighborhoods uh, all along the poles and everything like that. And then from, from uh, the, the poles outside of our homes, they're mounting uh, Wireless transmitters. transmitters. Basically little cell phone towers. Uh, Brentwood Bay, I think, is going to have around 100 uh, of these transmitters up and down all the streets in their neighborhood. And they're beaming that, that radiation at you 24 hours a day, whether you like it or not. Yeah, so... And, and there's not a word about it anywhere. It's like it's not happening, you know? No, I mean, Canada's environment minister today was saying how new technologies like uh, smart meters are going to help us 
you know, save money and the, the environment minister. And I'm sure she's seen hundreds and hundreds of pleas for help to protect us from, for, to protect our health. It just kind of goes by her and she's just selling that to the public. And that's a sad, sad thing that we're just being abandoned by people who should be looking at this issue in a realistic way. It really is a tragedy, isn't it? You know, our governments have just gone elsewhere. Well, if you're if you work for uh, trying to protect the environment, the very first thing you should you learn is how to handle disappointment. <laughs> because if you can't handle disappointment, you're not going to get very far, right? And every once in a while, we get a tiny, tiny vi victory. And when you get those little tiny victories, celebrate them and build on them. Because uh, we're we're like. Uh, we're like in the third period, and we're down a couple of guys on the roster, and we're getting battered. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not, not getting, making much headway. And we, got, we have to figure out a way to turn it around. And dramatic things, I think the proportional representation could be the catalyst to start changing the culture in, 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 in British Columbia, and maybe the rest of Canada will follow. Well, that's why the opposition to it is so great. It's so, it's so... Um... Yeah, and, and you know it's effective. They, you know, as as our guest said, it's uh, fear-based. Yeah. She said how how she said how good uh, how good proportional representation can be for a society, and she said they never question that. The no side never questions that yeah. because those are just facts. You can see them. What they throw in instead is fear and. Uh, I'm going to bring up Jack. I went to see uh, a Michael Moore movie, the new one out. It's called Fahrenheit 11.9, not 9/11. And it's just going over the American politics in the era of Trump and all that. And uh, I think the thing that I think Michael Moore is exploring but doesn't really get to the bottom of is how, why is it that the uh, people that call themselves the progressives and the Democrats in the United States, uh, how they haven't figured out the Republicans. They haven't figured out how Trump got elected yet. They haven't figured out their own mistakes. And, and, and they're really being exploited for that. That, you know, the, the Democrats can't believe that they're part of the problem. And they're handing it over to the Republicans. If you and I were looking at politics and wondering, well, how in the heck could the Republicans be still running very strong in these midterms? And you're going, there's something terribly wrong, something that we're not understanding, and the Democrats are not figuring it out. And that could bring us a, a a second term of Donald Trump, as hard as it is to believe, we are, might be heading for another term with this guy. And on that note, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, oh well. Um, thanks very much, Walt. Always and, a pleasure, Jack. Uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>